Well, it's good to be with you this morning. Uh, it's always fun coming here. Uh, I am Bishop Rommel, and uh, I grew up, just in case you don't know, uh, I grew up just um, about seven miles north of the Zion Church in Highway 1518. And uh, I'm not a cowboy, obviously. I don't look like a cowboy. But I always tell people I, I probably grow more cattle than most people that say they're cowboys. My dad and I farmed up that way for about 20 years. And uh, we ran a 150 head cow calf operation. I punched a lot of cattle, they run over by plenty of them. And uh, so I'm a cowboy car, you know, they don't look like it. Uh, I was a drinker and a smoker and a midnight toker, as the rock song says. Got saved in 1980 through a praying wife. Prayer works. Uh, Amen. And uh, pastored at Zion for almost 14 years. And by the way, there was a story up there around the Zion congregation. Back in the old days, the Brethren of Christ. Uh, which is the denomination we're all in, uh, believe that you got baptized on the day you got saved. And so the stories are they would break the ice off of a creek or a water tank and, and baptize people. And then for some reason they figured out that all the conversions were going down during the winter time. <laughs> so they said, well, maybe, maybe we should have a service at some point. Kind of like you were to do. So I encourage you to come and and bless those who are being baptized. Uh, <laughs> well, uh, God is good all the time. And uh, as we saw in our worship, He's great. Yes. <clears throat> but when I'm finished today, you may want to think about how you think of that good and great. Because we do live in a blessed culture. And sometimes we forget that 80% of the Christians around the world face daily persecution, sometimes death. Um, and there are times in our lives, and I've been there, uh, when we find ourselves with our back against the wall, and from all appearances, help is really not on the way. In times like these, it becomes increasingly difficult to maintain our faith and to tell people God is good all the time. And we may begin to think things like, you know, if God is real and God is good, then why am I going through this? Why do I feel a bit <laughs> skeptical friends may gather around us and say, where's your God now? And many times we don't have the answer <coughs> because we're starting to ask the same question deep in our hearts that we were telling them. Part of the reason for our angst and our doubt in times like these is that our portrait of God, how we understand God, our theology has been painted with poor paint, cheap paint, cheap grapes, Paint. Many Christians today have developed a faulty concept of God. We expect things from Him that He has not actually promised. And then when God does not come through in a way that we think He should, we feel betrayed. We feel abandoned. And often we fall away. I've seen it happen many times. God didn't come true, and so I'm leaving the church, I'm leaving Jesus. We lose faith, we give up on the church. This morning I want to consider, though, three great Bible characters who experienced what St. John of the Cross called the dark night of the soul. They endured what John Bunyan in his great Christian classic Pilgrim's Progress called the Slough of Despond. And then we're going to look at what eventually happened in their lives. And hopefully, we can learn some spiritual lessons. So first, you have outlines. 
uh, if you want to use it. And I see they removed the kids, but kids used to, they don't like outlines, so they made paper airplanes out of them. One church on the I don't encourage that if you're an adult that you're in your heart. First is Moses and the Israelites. That's the first thing on the outline. Now, before I read this scripture, let me refresh your memory about the story. The Israelites had been slaves in Egypt for around 400 years. And when God called Moses to go confront the Pharaoh and ask her, demand their freedom, the Pharaoh initially refused that. If you've read that book of Exodus, you'll know. But after 10 devastating plagues that took their toll on his wealth, his pride, and his family, he consented to let the people go. However, after they left, Pharaoh had a change of heart. And he sent his army of chariots to bring them back. Pharaoh's army caught up with the Israelites just as they had come to the Red Sea, the banks. They were literally trapped. Their backs were against the wall. And that's not a good place to be. They had no place to hide. Now, they were armed for battle, but nothing that would defeat the thousands of chariots that came after them. There was no human way they could defeat the Pharaoh and his army. So the Israelites did what most of us do when our backs are against the proverbial wall. They complained to God. And they complained about God. And the scripture we read next is God's answer to them in their whining and their doubt. Exodus 14, 15 to 22. Then the Lord said to Moses, why are you crying out to me? Tell the Israelites to move on. Raise your staff, stretch out your hand over the sea to divide the water so that the Israelites can go through the sea. Listen to this, on dry ground. Don't ever forget that. Sometimes people say, well, that sea was only four or five feet deep. Well, I don't know how deep it was, but explain to me how they went through on dry ground. Would you please? I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians so that they will go after them, and I will gain glory through Pharaoh and his army. Though his chariots and his horse, through his chariots and his horsemen, the Egyptians will know that I am the Lord when I gain glory through the Pharaoh, and his chariots, and his horsemen. Then the angel of God, who had been traveling in front of Israel's army, withdrew and went behind them. The pillar of cloud also moved from in front and stood behind them, coming between the armies of Egypt and Israel. Throughout the night, the cloud brought darkness to one side and light to the other side, so that neither went near the other all night long. And Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and all that night the Lord drove the sea back with a strong east wind, Turned it into dry land, the waters were divided, and the Israelites went through the sea on dry ground with a wall of water on their right and their left. Now God had an answer for the griping and the despair of Moses and the Israelites. When their backs were against the wall, God told them, stop whining and move on. I'll provide a way. And I will be glorified in the defeat of your enemies. But it will happen when the timing is right. Not when you demand it. It will happen when I will it. Your job is not to be victorious, but to be obedient. Amen. Now move toward the sea and wait for my glory to be revealed. And they did what God said to do, and listen, the rest is history. We talk about it in our Sunday school classes. God gained the victory over Pharaoh and the Egyptians, and he gained the glory. Now the second character I want to look at this morning is a, a fellow named Joseph. Joseph was the favorite son of Jacob, the great-grandson of Abraham. He was his daddy's favorite, 
And so his 11 brothers were very jealous of him to the point that they conspired to get rid of him. This is all in the Bible, people. Not everybody in Scripture was a nice person. First, they threw him down a well. And they were going to leave him there for death. But later, they decided to get him out and sell him into slavery in Egypt to some traders that were coming through. Well, Joseph was such a good servant in Egypt that he rose to a trusted place in a wealthy government official's household. He had it pretty good as slaves go. But he was also very handsome. And the government official's immoral wife took a shine to him and made him uh, sexual advances toward him. And when Joseph refused, she became angry and accused him of rape. So Joseph, listen, spent the next decade or so in prison for a crime he did not commit. Now there had to be some dark days of despair when he was there, confined. And probably some question about God's fairness, God's goodness, God's wisdom. And Joseph likely wondered why God would allow something like this to happen to him. It's reasonable to assume that he asked God for his freedom more than once, but it did not happen. He had to get discouraged at times. He likely spent a lot of nights wondering about those friends of his who had told him, God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. What Joseph didn't know yet was that God indeed did have a wonderful plan for his life. But it would be some time before Joseph could recognize it as a wonderful plan. And then years after languishing in prison through a set of miraculous events, Joseph was released. And again, he gained his freedom. And he moved to a position of power and influence, this time in the household of the Pharaoh himself. He eventually rose to the point where he was second in command over all of Egypt. He had a vision of a coming famine and, and, in the nation, and, and so he helped Egypt prepare for that. They stored up tons and tons, lots of grain. And when the famine did indeed happen across all the Middle East, guess who showed up in Egypt begging for food? Joseph's brothers. The very men who had betrayed him and sold him into slavery. The brothers who had stolen 20 years of his life. What would he do? Well, after some cat and mouse games, it's a fun story to read at the end of Genesis there. He finally decided to reveal himself to them. And they reacted with fear. Imagine their shock and their terror. I mean, he was in a position of great power. He could have had them killed with one word. But Joseph had been alone with God long enough to know that there's a bigger picture. And his words to them went like this, Genesis 50, 19 and 20. But Joseph said to them, don't be afraid. Am I in the place of God? You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. Joseph spent 20 years of his life in either slavery or prison, realized that God's plan was more important than his feelings. Are you listening to me, church? Because today, many Christians operate out of feelings rather than the truth. He realized that God had something bigger in mind than his earthly comfort. He realized in the end, and he was reunited with his family and became a Christ-type Savior by rescuing them from starvation. There's a third story. A man named Job. Job was an all around great guy. He lived under God's authority and God's blessing. You read that story, it's amazing all the stuff he had. And then one day, everything fell apart. 
in a single day, he lost everything. He lost all his livestock, he lost all of his children, and eventually he lost his health, almost lost his wife, and for a time, he lived in a city dump, scraping scabs off of him. Loneliness and despair. No one, including Job himself, fully understood the reasons for what he was going through. Now listen, if you read the book of Job, the question of why is never answered in that book. But then one day, just like that, his ordeal came to an end. And the Bible says, Job 42, after Job had prayed for his friends, the Lord made him prosperous again and gave him twice as much as he had before. The Lord blessed the latter part of Job's life more than the first. So three men, three stories of dark days, fear, despair, feelings of abandonment, and then victory. Now I doubt that many of us here have gone through the same exact situations as these three men. But I do know that many of us have had or will have days, months, even years where we struggle. God seems silent. Times when our backs are against the wall, darkness closes in around us, slouches of the spot, dark nights of the soul, where fear and anger threaten to consume us, where bitterness and disappointment knock on our door every day and invite, have, want us to let them in. We, we've had or will have days or nights wondering why God does not do something, anything, to relieve the pain. We suffer great loss at times. That happens. We live in frustration. We feel abandoned. And the question in our hearts is, Lord, where are you? I can't feel you. I can't see you. I'm not hearing you. But the wise and mature among us have learned that God often has something in mind for us that we do not yet understand. And we have learned to wait upon the Lord. So today I want to draw three lessons from these great Bible characters. And the first is this. And folks, hang on to your hats. Because this is a shocker in today's bless me Lord culture. But here it is. There are times when God wants us cornered. Many of us carry around this skewed idea that if we just walk closely with God, we deserve a happy life on a daily basis. God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life, right? But never forget this. It's God's plan, not ours. God is in control, not us. And for many Christians, wonderful plan means I'm comfortable, I'm healthy, my bills are paid, happily married, two well-behaved athletic children, and a fulfilling, good-paying job. It comes with the anticipation that nothing but blessing, success, good health, and prosperity could be mine forever. That's the, that's the Facebook life. <laughs> you know, those people on Facebook that have the perfect life, you wish you had. But guess what? Hey. They don't. That's what wonderful can start to mean to us. But God's wonderful plan is seldom like that in the real world. You see, God's plan brings glory to Him, not us, in some way and at some time. But it may be painful for us as we wait for that to happen. I've been through this. So have some of you. God's <coughs> wonderful plan is about the glory of God and the saving of souls not about our personal prosperity and comfort. Think about it. If anyone was close to God, it was Moses, Joseph, and Job. If anyone deserved happiness, it was them. And look at what they went through. Now listen to me. Do you honestly think 
that God operates differently with us because we are so special. Listen carefully. Coming to the Red Sea and being feeling defeated and fearful was just as much a part of God's wonderful plan as crossing that Red Sea. He was working on their hearts. The tears that will likely flow as God works upon us with his plan in his time and his way. But the desperation of having our backs against the wall can become very significant and real. Sometimes God wants us cornered. Then at some point, like Moses, we realize that this predicament is in God's hands. It can become like a highway through the sea of despair into the promised land. That's what happened. Joseph's predicament lasted for 20 years, people, and it seemed to go from bad to worse. But despite his dark circumstances, God was carrying out his plan to bless Joseph and Joseph's people and in the process benefit the very ones who had betrayed him. God's plan. God's time. Joseph was chosen to rescue them. And a few families turned into millions in the years to come. God does have a plan. It just may not include our immediate comfort. Are you with me? Yes. And in Job's case, despite his inability to see the end of his agony and grief, God was doing a work in him and in his friends. It was a work that would teach them some vital theological truth, which we desperately need in the church today. And it would end with Job being better off than he was before. I have a saying that I use. Uh, the church in the USA is about 3,000 miles wide and about a half inch thick. We're thin ice when it comes to theological thinking. And, and this is theology. God is glorified even in our traumas and hard times. His suffering would eventually lead, Job's suffering would lead to blessing. Now the bottom line here is that God is not always the God of quick relief. Sometimes we think he is. We cry out to him, he doesn't come through today. And we start thinking, well, he's not listening to me. Now, this may sound like blasphemy to modern Christians, but sometimes God wants us cornered, and God wants us to be uncomfortable. He works at helping us sometimes to feel outnumbered. It's how he builds faith in us. You don't grow muscle unless you break it down by exercising it. And faith needs to be grown by having times when our faith is tested. Our daily comfort level takes a back seat to God's bigger plan in this world and his plan for our lives. Never forget, he is the potter, we are the clay, and he can make us anything he wants. And in these dark nights of the soul, there are often no signs of relief, no trite church slogans to boost our self-esteem, no assistance to be found in that celebrity preacher self-help book that you can get for $21.95 if you just send in the offering. Sometimes there will be no light at the end of the tunnel. You can't see it. No visible hope, no help on the way. There's just that deep, uncrossable red sea and that approaching army of death behind us. There's just that lonely dungeon of despair and captivity there's just that debris pile that used to be your house, that carcasses, the carcasses of all your livestock laying out in the field, and the fresh graves of your family. We have, we have no human defense against this. We are powerless. And so we wait because we can do nothing else, and we pray. And time passes, and eventually... In his time, in his way, God shows up and his purpose will be accomplished. So, so bite your nails, cuss, stew all you want. God is never in a hurry because he lives outside of time. 
in eternity. Do you feel cornered right now with something in your life? Are you up against it in some way? Do you feel overwhelmed? It, it, it matters not so much if your predicament is part of God's design or if it's through your own foolishness like mine usually was. You are not invisible to God. He has not deserted you. There is a work going on that you cannot see. In many cases, it takes these dark and dreary back alleys of heartache, and hopelessness, and abandonment to prepare us for God's glorious day of deliverance. So the next time you're tempted to think, where is God when I need him? Remember these three guys. God knows exactly where you are. And it may be that you're in the right place at the right time, just like you're supposed to be. There are times when God wants us cornered. And God will come, take a deep breath, and keep praising Him. He loves you. Because number two today, God is faithful, and He is preparing us for something. We just don't know what it is. The Lord is with us. He is for us. He uses our troubles and our calamities to prepare us for a work that we do not yet know. Adversity is painful. Loss can be devastating. But the Lord uses it to further his purposes, to equip us, to carry out his plan, to grow the kingdom, to bring glory to him. I spent 20 years of my life playing in rock band and drinking myself into a stupor. I did not know that God was preparing me to go to Salina, Kansas and, and plant a church called the Rock and Roll Rehab Church, where 80% of the people come out of addiction. And I understood that. Because I lived in the slough of the slog for so many years. Because Moses and God's people had been backed up against the sea with no place to go. The miracle that followed would be passed down through all the ages to the glory of God. We still talk about this story today. Think about it. <laughs> Moses and God's people were better for having been through this and for believing. And during his unplanned and wanted stay in Egypt, what? I want to ask you a question. And it's something that I myself have went through in my own life. We were talking about all of the religion and the drugs and everything else, and you even going to the rock band. And in those times when things were hitting hard for you, you knew in your heart that you needed to ask how, why, where do I need to go, what I need to do. And it was inside of you that all the whole time. You act. Every time you get pointed in a direction. And then you lead astray. Go right back to what you were doing. Then it hits again. Like you're saying, God corners it. And then he goes and you ask again. What do I do? Go down a little further? No. You understand what I'm saying? That's what I want to know from you. Did that ever happen in your lifetime when you were in those moments? Oh, yeah. You hear God long before you will uh, obey Him. <coughs> That's the Holy Spirit. I'm saying the faith of it, that you knew He was there. No, I didn't. You were know. looking for that help to get out of the turmoil. Well, yeah. You look for help, but you look for help in a lot of things. Uh, and you see, I'm not sure I understand the mysteries of how the Holy Spirit draws people to Jesus. But I know this. He had to break my heart before I gave my soul to him. Yes. And he may have to do that to all of us. Yes. And the way he breaks your heart is through the trouble. And yes, uh, many times you do hear something, but you ignore it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. That's throughout Scripture, too. And uh, we just do our best to pray for people, and those prayers make a difference. 
See, God, God listens to the prayers of his people. You have that daughter, that granddaughter, that son who's off in the dark night of the soul. Pray for them. Ask the church to pray for them. I didn't, I, I, my wife prayed by herself for four years. And then she made the wife move to sick the women of the Zion's prayer group on you. <laughs> and it was downhill from there. I started to see things I've never seen. My spiritual eyes began to open. My ears began to open. And even then, my stubborn heart would not submit until he broke my heart. And he will do the same to you. And he does that, you see, because he loves you. Your soul is invaluable to him. But there comes a day when you must step across the line. And even though you may not live perfectly after that, you know who you belong to after that. I belong to the night. There's a great song in the Phantom of the Opera called The Music of the Night. Listen to it sometime. I was in the music of the night. God wanted to be, me to be in the music of the day. And so he called me there finally. And I made it. Uh, and not everybody does. I have friends who died in the night. And you will too. But that's not God's problem. God loves each of you. He calls us all. He allows you to have a free will to say yes or no. And at the end of this message, I'm going to give you an opportunity to say yes or no. Because that's what preaching is. Let me get back here. <coughs> Joseph, in his stay in Egypt, was eventually placed into a position where he could serve his family. That is where God wants us. During Job's ordeal, he became a witness to his friends. And God's nature was revealed in a greater way. See, there's this process that we go through. Why does God save us? Why doesn't God, when we get saved, just zap us to heaven? You know why? He leaves us here to be a light yes. and to be a witness. That's how he has shown. Now, you can cuss him all you want for that. It's not going to help. He has left you, church, to be light in the Abilene area. You are a light to somebody that you may not even know. They're watching you. They're watching your life. They want to see if Christianity really does make a difference. So do your best. And as God's children, we can take to heart in knowing that our pain, our suffering, whatever it is, our foolishness is never wasted. God, there's a word in the Bible called redemption. God redeems your problems, your suffering. You know what, you know what redemption is? Yesterday, my wife sent me to Dillon's. We live about two blocks from there, and she had other things to do. I took a coupon with me. I cut it out of the paper, and the coupon was for 75 cents off of a half a gallon of milk, I think it was. Now, that piece of paper was, <laughs> well, I couldn't have bought gas with it. It's worthless. It's a piece of paper. But when I took it to Dillon's, Guess what they did? They redeemed it. They made my paper coupon worth something. And that's what God wants to do with our lives. He wants to redeem our lives. He wants to change the meaning from worthless paper to something of value. That's redemption. And that's the business he is in. Now, he may allow a need of ours to go unmet or something cherished in our life to be removed. His purpose is that we confess our dependence on him and we trust in him. Uh, in, in 2010, I had a grandson born. And I'm telling you, I don't know if you have any grandchildren yet, but they steal your heart. Amen. His eyes, I swear, he could look right through my soul into my soul 
and at two months of age, he died of sin, sudden infant death syndrome. And I'll be honest, that was a, it took me a while. I said, God, what are you up to here? Two things came out of his death. One, a celebration over at the Crossroads Church once a year called Kingdom Jam. And Kingdom Jam had bands come in from churches all over. And in the 10 years that it ran, we raised over $50,000 for SIDS research. Because doctors did not know much about it. And now they have finally, with some of that research and some of our money contributed to it, they've discovered at least where the switch is in the brain. Now they don't know why it shuts off breathing in the heart, but it's they know where it is now, so there's progress. The second thing that happened out of that is my son, who was working at a bank and not really all that happy, God spoke to him and said, what worse can happen to you? Why don't you do something big? And he had always wanted to be a doctor. Mm -hmm. but he, had, he didn't even have his undergrad degree yet. And he's 40-some years old. You don't go back to med school then. Mm -hmm. But he goes, okay, what else worse can happen? And so he did. And now he has a practice in Salon, Kansas. Mm -hmm. God has redeemed Zane's death. Now, that doesn't bring him back, but he's changed the meaning of that event in our lives. Now, all these things that happen to us, sometimes his purpose is to bring us to a point where we are not afraid anymore. And we take a big step. Sometimes his purpose is to show us our sin, because sometimes... We don't act right when things like that. Sometimes our difficulties may, though, actually prevent us from going astray. We don't know why this stuff happens. We may never know the reasons for all of our heartaches. But the wise choice, and this is my main message here today, continue to trust God. He's doing something. And you know what? It's frankly none of your business right now. Mm -hmm. And that's hard to take it. We think God ought to share his business with us, but he doesn't. But he knows. He knows where you are. He has promised you eternal good. Romans 8, 28. We know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. All things. Now, there's a third thing we can be certain of, and I'm getting ready to finish up there. When, when God is finished, the difficulty will end. Not when you're finished, when God is finished. <clears throat> but we may not always be able to see the light at the end of the tunnel, but the tunnel does have an end. Might be just around the next bend. So keep going. When the despair of the Israelites had reached its peak at God's chosen moment, he gave the message in the sea part. The worst enemy they had was now themselves, because <laughs> the Egyptians were gone. And if you read the rest of the story, they did a pretty good job of being their own enemies. <laughs> and one morning, after another one of those endless nights in a dark prison cell, Joseph heard the key in the lock, and just like that, he was free. Just like that. Hallelujah. And soon he was made a high-ranking official in the, in the government, and he was given an opportunity to help save his family. And after Job had vented his worst of accusations toward his fickle friends and even toward God, the Lord stepped in, and his suffering was over. Read the scriptures. God blessed the latter part of his life more than the first. And in the same way, God says to us today, it ain't over until I say it's over. But when I say it's over, it's over. At a moment in time, when the time fully comes, God will say, it is finished. Darkness will be vanquished, and our ordeal will become a memory. It happened with Moses. 
Exodus 14, 22. And the Israelites went through the sea on dry ground with a wall on the water on, on their right and their left. It happened to Job, Job 42, 10 and 12. The Lord made him prosperous again and gave him twice as much as he had before. The Lord blessed the latter part of his life more than the first. And it happened to Joseph, Genesis 50. Joseph stayed in Egypt along with his father's family. He lived 110 years and saw the third generation of Ephraim's children. And it can happen to us in his time. We simply must wait and not turn away from the Lord. So what is God saying to you personally? What does he want you to learn in the midst of your dark nights of the soul? Are you listening for him? Are you waiting? Remember, even Jesus suffered to fulfill God's purpose. 1 Peter 3.18 For Christ died for our sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. He was put to death in the body, but made alive in the spirit. Hebrews 5, 8 and 9. Although he was a son, he learned obedience from what he suffered. And once made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who will obey him. Amen. And then, this is not on your notes and it won't appear on the screen. I just caught this verse yesterday and I want to share it with you. Isaiah 53. 3 through 5. This is about Jesus. He was despised and rejected by men. A man of sorrows, familiar with suffering, like one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised. And we esteemed him not. Surely he took up our infirmities, he carried our sorrows. Yet we considered him stricken by God, smitten by him, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him. And by his wounds, suffering, we are healed. If Jesus went through times like these, should we really expect to be any different? Now, by now you figured out this isn't your average prosperity sermon. <laughs> God wants to prosper us, but in a different way than we often think. He wants us to grow strong and rich spiritually, and that often comes through suffering. Now, maybe it's time to quiet down a little and listen and wait on God in your life. Maybe it's time to trust the same God that came through for Moses and Joseph and Job in his time, not theirs. Maybe it's time to quit whining about life and complaining and start doing something trusting. One of the, one of the things that most people, if, if they haven't been around addicts and alcoholics, is that most of them are whiners. And we put up a big sign at the Crossroads Church behind the coffee bar. No whining. <laughs> because no one can feel sorry for themselves like someone who's addicted. In fact, they use that as an excuse to be more addicted. God says, wake up, people. Maybe it's time to give your life fully to Him. Maybe that's Maybe that's why things aren't working right, because you've been trying to get out of it on your own, doing things yourself, not really fully trusting in Jesus, because you're not sure you can trust God. You can do that right here, in this room. You can do that today. Maybe for the first time. Maybe for the tenth time. You come back to Jesus. You could resolve to walk in faith from this day forward. You could stop asking him to get you out of the rubble and start asking him to be glorified in it. Amen. You could do that today. Maybe it's time. Let's stand for prayer, please. Lord, I want to thank you for those who have heard 
the message. I want to pray for those who have tried to block it out, that you will get truth with the truth in their hearts eventually. We don't need to know when that happens, but Lord, I know that's the way it works. And so God, today I want to pray for this new trail congregation and for Pastor Stan and for Beth and just ask that you bless them. Many times it won't be a blessing like they think, but they'll be stronger when they get through it. So Lord, today, put your hand, guide this, this congregation, guide the individuals in here that are hearing your voice today. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Now, before you leave, <coughs> I made a deal with God when I went to Salina, Kansas to start the Crossroads Church that I would never give another message without asking people to commit their life to Jesus. And so I'm asking you to do that today. Every man, Billy Graham used to say this in his crusades, every man that Jesus ever called, he called publicly. And one of the reasons it took me a long time is I tried to do a lot of private transactions with God. But Jesus called every person he ever called out of the crowd to take steps of faith toward him. So I'm going to ask you to do that today. If this is your day, if God is speaking to you, you just come and stand in the front, we'll dismiss the people and I'll pray with you. So that's the, that's the call. Lord, bless this group as they go out of here. Keep your hand upon them. Lift them up. Encourage them even in the darkness. And make them strong beyond measure. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 God bless you all. Thanks for putting up with us. Thank you. <laughs>